Hello, and welcome to the section on Art of the African Diaspora in the Americas. So um, since this section usually comes at the end of the class, where uh, the end of the course, when time is kind of tight, um, I assume that you know a little bit about Black American history. Um, however, if you don't, um, I'll provide a link to some some links to some videos that maybe could help you out a little bit in getting to that. Um, but other than that, how I explore this issue with my students is I found that this was a good couple of questions to ask. Um, so what I suggest is that if you want to explore these issues and kind of understand some of the issues that the artists um, from here and then in contemporary um, art will talk about, these two questions will help you out. So the first one is, what does black mean? And the second one is, what does white mean? And what often will come up in the class is people ask, well, what do you mean by black? Or what do you mean by white? And what I would prefer to do is leave that open um, because uh, even if you think there's, and there is, many ways to define this word and what, it's, what meanings it's attached to, um, exploring the other meanings that it's attached to can help you understand the concepts of black and the concepts of white um, in other domains. Um, so I highly encourage you to take this question to the extra credit board um, and try to explore what it means. So in the African diaspora, we're going to talk about some outsider artists, um, some folk artists, and some fine artists. Um, so kind of coming to from every angle. And part of the reason why when we talk about African Americans and we talk about outsider artists or folk artists is because um, black people in America have had limited access to schools and other art institutions that w enable you to be part of, and I put the air quotes up, the fine art world. Um, as we go along in the class, we'll talk about how um, black people are treated and how they have to mediate um, their identity and roles inside of a white-dominated art institute. Um, so the first artist we're going to talk about is kind of an outsider artist. Uh, and if you're not familiar with that, what that term means, uh, it can be kind of a blanket term that says artists that didn't go to art school, aren't showing in galleries, something like that. Um, sometimes these artists will eventually show in galleries or sell their art in some way. Uh, sometimes they won't, as is in the case with James Hampton and is the throne of the third heaven of the nation's Millennium General Assembly. Um, so Hampton never considered himself an artist. He's pictured here uh, wearing a good suit in front of his art, which he hadn't shown anyone while he was alive. Um, he was a janitor in Washington, D.C. And if you're not aware, uh, Washington, D.C., um, at that time was becoming a heavily black city um, and um, remained so until fairly recently. Uh, it, this particular piece or a set of pieces was built in his basement um, and it was unknown until his death. Uh, so when he died, his family went to his house and they looked in the garage and they found this uh, and then they found pictures and writings explaining what was going on. Uh, so people were fascinated by this person who was quite literally an outsider artist um, working outside of, of um, any sort of art institution and not even trying to get recognized in any way um, outside of himself. So when you look at the materials, it kind of shows here. Uh, so Hampton didn't have any art training, so he's using what he could get his hands on, gold and silver aluminum foil, craft paper and plastic over wood furniture, paperboard. Um, and as, as the description says, it's 180 pieces in an overall configuration. And it was organized like this in the pictures, so you'll see them displayed in that way sometimes. Um, so the way he set it up was kind of like art that he had learned about. Uh, so on the left, he has the New Testament, and on the right, he has the Old Testament. So for Christians, um, they often see um, the Old Testament, um, or sometimes called the Jewish Bible, 
um, as being a precursor to Jesus Christ. Uh, so the New Testament, which includes the Gospels and, and the Epistles, um, they will often refer back to the Old Testament, especially things that they see as being precursors to Christ or predicting Christ. Um, so he's kind of working with that kind of idea. So to look at one example, um, he was inspired by Revelation, uh, and he called himself St. James. So if you're not familiar with Revelation, um, it is the last book in the Christian Bible. It's sometimes called the Apocalypse. Um, so it's about the end of the world. Um, the person who is writing, who identifies himself uh, as the speaker, um, is having a vision about the end of the world and these various processes and what will happen. Um, so you can kind of read it on that level. Um, if you are talking about Revelation in other contexts, um, you can also talk about how it relates to Jewish mysticism, like we had talked about with the Kabbalah in Ethiopia. Um, but that stuff isn't necessarily really important with what Hampton is doing. Um, so he believed, like the speaker in the book of Revelation, that God had instructed him um, what to do. So God instructed him each night on what to build. And he had visions, again, like the author of, of Revelation, of Mary, Moses, and Adam. Uh, so you can kind of see how this plays out in the art. Um, we have like some angels. Uh, we have these these kind of like uh, shimmering qualities to the work. Um, and a lot of that comes from imagery symbolism uh, inside of the book of Revelation. So this one, again, we have these angel wings, stars. Uh, the foil adds to the like kind of shimmering thing. Uh, so to quote from Revelation, and the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. Um, so he's talking about the throne of the third heaven and the nation's millennium general assembly. So this is kind of like um, what you see in a lot of churches, uh, and that's kind of an apocalyptic um, type of belief, a belief that, the, that Christ is going to come back to the earth as predicted in Revelation. Uh, and the believers will be able to reach salvation. Um, so this was something that was very interesting to him. Along with this, he created a language, um, and I have a link which I'll include that tries to analyze what was going on with his writing. Um, so the secret writing of James Hampton, I'll put that in the description for this video. And he wrote in a secret script as God has, has instructed John, the writer, uh, the believed writer of Revelation. Um, so we see that here. The script hasn't been deciphered yet. Um, and cryptologists and other people that do this sort of thing for a living have worked on it. Uh, maybe in the future um, it'll be readable. But for now, um, it is not understood what type of cryptography or what system he used um, to be able to write um, these verses. So to move on to an artist, um, and you would sometimes call artists like Harriet Powers um, craft artists or um, something along those lines. And I don't know if that is something that I would feel comfortable with doing. Um, I don't think that there is any hard lines between what artists do when they're portraying things in galleries and what people who don't consider themselves artists do uh, whenever they're making um, visual materials um, for themselves or for their friends and family. Uh, so Powers um, was like a lot of women, um, black women, who lived in the South, and white women did this as well often in the South, um, is they made these pictorial quilts. Um, the reason why we're looking at Powers quilts is because hers um, seem to have a little bit more meaning uh, than what you would normally see from the quilts coming out. So Powers was um, a former slave. Uh, she lived in Georgia, and she got went into quilting parties. And again, this is something black women would do and white women would do as well. Um, these kinds of meetings um, would mirror what we had seen in Africa with secret societies 
they wouldn't necessarily be secretive, but they could be a way for women to get to get together uh, and find support. Um, so, if you haven't already recognized what's going on here uh, in this, there's a lot of visual imagery that relates to the Bible, um, but there's also visual imagery that you may not recognize. So before you go on to the next slide, hit pause on the video and see if you can find some stories that um, you could recognize if you know anything about the Bible. So do that now, and then when you're ready, move on to the next one. So how Powers was discovered, putting up the air quotes, uh, is that faculty ladies at Atlanta University, uh, they commissioned this piece. Uh, they had heard about the type of work she was doing. Uh, and um, some of them wanted to give some support to this sort of thing. So you kind of have to realize when you're talking about these types of actions that were happening in the South, um, even though they're certainly um, not brutal like the institution of slavery, they're still coming out of places from white supremacy. Uh, so there was this idea of like cultivating um, certain arts in black people, but since it's coming from uh, white supremacy, it's also a way to kind of like narrow the, the um, options for black people. Uh, so um, you wouldn't necessarily see faculty ladies at Atlanta University um, supporting a painter or someone that wanted to go to the university. So it was a gift in 1898 to Reverend Charles Cuthbert Hall, the chairman of the board of trustees of Atlanta University. Uh, eventually this did have um, positive effects. Um, but again, just remember the place that it's coming from. Um, it's more of a kind of white savior type of place than a truly supportive place. So Jenny Smith, who was an art teacher, um, she had heard about Power's work and she brought another one of her quilts. Um, and Harriet Powers, because she was raised as a slave, uh, she was illiterate. Um, and Again, I'm not sure how, much, how familiar you are, um, but slavery in the United States uh, was similar to the institution of apartheid uh, that we saw in South Africa, uh, in that um, black people that were enslaved uh, were kept away from certain types of skills, and being the reed was one of them. Um, and this was part of the kind of like colonial and enslaving project um, to control black people, um, so to prevent things like uprisings. Uh, so they didn't want people to be able to read uh, because they didn't want them to be able to, to access things that they could read. They also didn't want to, want to like things that could lead to revolution or, or thinking more highly of themselves. Uh, but also they didn't want them to be able to use them for more practical things um, to keep um, slaves feeling like they were dependent on their masters. So some of these stories are ones that relate to cultural stories that would be familiar to everyone in the South. Um, so this one uh, is about a real event, November 13th, 1833. There was a fairly intense meteor shower uh, and a lot of people uh, believe that this could be the second coming of Christ. Uh, so in the South, uh, in both black churches and white churches, uh, there are a lot of kind of apocalyptic type of beliefs. Uh, so this was something that we, um, that people interpreted. So if you look at this picture, um, you could probably pick out the meteors. Uh, so the things that look like stars. Um, but, uh, and you can pick out the people on the ground who are kind of praying to the heavens. But God is also pictured in this one. Um, if you go up to the hand, uh, literally the hand of God. Oh, and I should mention I love how the kitty is down here because kitties. So this one um, was referring to another event. So May 19th and 1780s, stars were seen during the day. Uh, and this was a story that was passed down, even though it happened uh, before Harry Powers was born. And it was caused by Canadian wildfires at this time. Um, so you can again see the people on the ground. Um, the stars during the day, uh, the animals down here, uh, but God, again, um, the big, big light that's coming, you can see that 
So this one has to do, and the story sounds very Southern to me, Bets, the independent hog that ran 500 miles from Georgia to Virginia. Um, and this is kind of like, there's a lot of stories about dogs with the same thing. Uh, people are attached to both dogs and, and pigs. Uh, so that's what she's referring to in this one. This one for where ours is one of the biblical stories. Um, so you can kind of take a moment, try to figure out what it is. And now I'll see, I'll tell you what's going on. Um, so this is the crucifixion of Christ. Uh, we have Christ in the middle and then the two thieves uh, that were crucified with him. Um, we have a couple of Marys down here. Uh, all of Christ's fo male followers except John had left him. Um, and then his side was pierced. Um, and we can kind of see that where um, there's blood and water coming out of it, like it explained in the Bible, hence she didn't use the red color. So this one um, is another Old Testament story. So at first you may not recognize it, but you can pause the video and kind of test yourself and see if you could recognize the story. So now that you're back, I'll tell you what's going on here. Uh, this is Adam and Eve. And there's references to all of the parts of this creation story. Uh, we have the serpent with legs who talks and talking to Eve in this one. Um, we have a bone, a rib being taken out of Adam uh, in the Bible. That's what God used to create Eve. Um, we have the eyes of God up here, the hand of God up here as well. So referring to his creation and watching over people. Um, we have uh, the light in the day. So God is placed in between because that's what happens. Um, sorry, the day and the night. Uh, one of the first things he does is he creates the light and separates the day from the night. Um, and then we have pairs of figures. Um, <laughs> I think she's making it pretty obvious which ones are feminine and which ones are masculine in this one. Uh, so referring to these animals in the Garden of Eden. So the last one is an Old Testament story. And you can, again, pause the video right now to see if you want to guess. Um, but this is a particular story that had been appealing to black people in the 19th century and into um, Christian black people uh, into the 20th and 21st centuries as well. Um, and this is the story of Jonah and the whale. Um, so Christians uh, interpret this in quite a few different ways. One of the ways is they saw this as a story that was a precursor to Christ. Uh, Jonah um, was on a boat. He fell into the water, was swallowed by a whale. Um, everyone thought he was dead. Uh, he was in the whale for three days, and then he emerged from the whale and was alive again. So the story of Jesus um, dying um, and then being dead for three days and then rising after three days uh, is related to this. But it's also a story that um, in ancient Judaism related to um, the idea of Jewish people um, were, uh, the, most of these stories were written while Jewish people were in diaspora. Um, so they were no longer in the land that they believed God had given them, uh, and they'd been taken to other places um, and were in exile. Uh, and they look forward to the time when they would eventually um, get back to the land that was promised them and be free. So you could kind of see how this would be appealing to people who are former slaves. Um, you know, slavery is a, something that takes your freedom completely. Um, but if you see this in um, a Christian idea, you can see um, a life coming forward for black people where they are free after emerging from this terrible turmoil. Um, and if you think of the idea of crucifixion that kills you, uh, but then you rise again, kind of resplendent, um, that would be something that would be appealing as well to people who are formerly enslaved, basically had gone through the apocalypse in some ways, uh, and were looking forward to a return. So I'm showing you this, and um, I don't think that you could point to scholarship that shows a direct relationship um, between these two different styles of art. One in this 12 Kings of Dahomey, uh, which is from the country of Bainan, 
um, and then Harriet Powers and her quilt. Uh, but it is interesting to see the parallels between um, what Powers is doing and what you see from Dahomey. Um, so during slavery, um, especially in um, what would become the United States, um, there was a big effort to destroy and squash all cultural practices of black people. So they weren't allowed to, if they had um, lived in Africa and then had been sold into slavery afterwards, they weren't allowed to talk their original language. They weren't allowed to use their original name. Uh, no practices. Um, so no religious practices, none of that sort of thing. In other parts of the Americas, some of those were, were allowed to survive, uh, but not here. But still, um, scholars, when they look at things like music, for instance, uh, and the types of notes that were used, um, and this was something that black people, even when they were enslaved, could use kind of strategically, um, that there's things that poke through. Uh, so there could be things, despite a really good effort to squash it, um, that survived, uh, and, you know, it could have been that there's influence, but again, the scholarship isn't quite there. So moving on to artists that are considered to be fine artists uh, in the Harlem Renaissance. So in the 20s and 30s, um, the black communities, which had been building for a long time uh, in New York City, um, created a kind of like flowering of art, scholarship, music, um, philosophy, um, ideas of government, and a kind of international focus of black liberation. And all of these things came together uh, in Harlem uh, in the 20s and 30s. And one thing that's important to remember is that this movement was consciously international, but um, black people didn't have the direct access to um, Africans in Africa. Uh, so there is um, quite a bit of distance. We'll see how it changes when we get closer in now. So in this one, which is called the Congolese um, by Nancy Elizabeth Prophet, um, she was trained as an artist. Um, she taught eventually at Spelman College uh, in Atlanta. Um, and with this one, even though it's called Congolese, um, it is not a, a Congolese person. Uh, it's more like the Maasai who live, uh, they have a similar kind of lifestyle to Fulani, who we talked about before, uh, and they live in similar areas, but mostly farther in Northeast Africa. But um, in the Americas, in, especially in the 20s, uh, there was a lot of exposure to a limited um, African style. So Egypt was one of them. There was a big trend with Egypt, uh, Ethiopia, and Congo. Um, and because these were the ones that people were exposed to for various reasons, um, there wasn't enough information to be able to um, attest certain types of cultural practices to um, the culture that it came from. So the Maasai, they were photographed a lot because their style uh, is kind of incredible. You can, you can look them up and, and see, like, they still keep their traditional styles, which is really cool nowadays. Um, but, you know, people, because they didn't have direct access and there wasn't really good scholarship uh, and like this working kind of in a white supremacist environment, um, people didn't have direct access um, to the information they needed to be able to attest these. But, however, um, what Prophet is doing um, is, according to Harris, the work attempts to penetrate the facade of stereotypes that limited Western understanding of African peoples at the time. Um, so if you take a look at what she did, she created a sculpture where it's very much like she's working in a Western tradition. Um, it's very much like what you would see in a Western sculpture showing like an ideal um, male beauty or female beauty uh, and an ideal that doesn't just represent beauty, but represents good things. Uh, so that represents uh, what it means to be a good human being, uh, perfection, humanism, all of these things. Uh, so even though she doesn't have um, access to information to be able to tell her that this is Maasai, uh, she's still lifting um, black people by creating this kind of image, which would be in opposition to the racist imagery that you would get 
um, from most other institutions uh, and the white supremacist society that is the United States. So many of the artists like Aaron Douglas and his aspiration um, were influenced by international movements. So Douglas was born in Kansas uh, and then he eventually moved to Detroit and um, he took some art classes over at the DIA, so right across the street from our school. And then he went to the University of Nebraska and got an art degree there. Uh, and while he was there, um, he was exposed to um, a lot of different um, liberation movements um, around the world. He eventually moved to Harlem, because uh, Harlem was basically Paris at that time. Uh, and um, he made pictures, and I'll give you some links to some, for a, um, the magazine that was produced by the NAACP uh, called The Crisis. If you're familiar with the modern NWACP, you may um, see it as an organization that's um, you know, positive, but kind of like old or, or not very active or whatnot, or, or you know, embedded in other institutions. Um, at this time though, uh, it was created by people like W.E.B. Du Bois, or Du Bois, <laughs> sorry, I want to pronounce things like, like, like they're, they're French, but he said Du Bois. Um, and it was an international libertarian movement uh, based in the United States for black people uh, and very explicitly um, embraced socialism um, as the way for black people to reach liberation. So if you look at um, Aaron Douglas and then look up the crisis, you'll find a lot of references to socialist ideas written in the magazine. Eventually, uh, the NWACP uh, split into the faction like WB Du Bois that was um, a little bit more militant and radical as far as what they believed that black people needed to be liberated. And then people who were uh, more interested in embedding themselves in institutions that were already existing. Um, you know, W.D.B. Du Bois, again, you'd, he looked towards socialism as liberatory, and the other groups would look towards um, kind of fitting into capitalist society uh, as a way to liberate themselves. So this was before that split, and Douglas in this one is using a lot of visual shorthand um, so you can kind of like, if you want to, again, pause the video and take to the extra credit board to explore this a little bit. Uh, but you can see a dynamic going on. Um, so Douglas is using a very modern style. You may recognize um, some futurism in this one. Uh, and this is certainly the earliest piece of Afrofuturism uh, that we're going to look at in this class. And like a lot of pieces of Afrofuturism, and think of Black Panther, the film uh, from a few years ago, in your head, uh, these are utopias. Um, so it's not talking about a world like, you know, one of those zombie movies or TV shows or whatever, where the world is ended and everything sucks. Instead, they're looking towards, okay, how, what does the new world where black people are liberated look like? Um, so you can see that here, the old world below, and then the new world as we rise above. Um, there's the city. And what's located? We have the super modern buildings. Uh, we have factories. Uh, so this is talking about uh, moving forward in society, um, productive forces moving towards a more modern uh, world. Um, we have black figures so who you can tell from their silhouettes um, that are black people. Um, and they are looking up towards the future and pointing. They're carrying pieces of iconography, the book, the scholar. Um, this one is, he's carrying kind of like chemical devices. Uh, so the scientist, uh, and then right here, the architect, the engineer, uh, and you can see the world kind of placed below and then the old world way below. Uh, so slavery chains and, um, you know, since they're looking at this from, again, a socialist perspective, a Marxist pers perspective, um, that line, you have nothing to lose, but your chains, um, from Marx uh, in the Communist Manifesto is being kind of visualized in this way. Um, and then, you know, looking forward to what can we create? We've lost our chains. What, is that, what does that enable us to create? Enables us to create a world where we're in control uh, and focused. 
Um, so this image right here, uh, the star, uh, is a symbol of socialism, but there's also layers of meaning to both the star and um, the city on a hill. Uh, black people recognize that this kind of American mythology, that the United States was this city on a hill, um, a country that was created in an exceptional way to be an example for the rest of the world. Um, of course, black people would know that um, these exceptions, um, the United States uh, military and industrial might was built on the brutal exploitation of black people uh, and other um, oppressed peoples. Um, so they didn't see the city in America as being the city of the hill. They saw it as um, a rep repressive place, um, the end of the world in some ways. But playing on that imagery of a city and hill and putting into the socialist context, um, it does place it in America, kind of taking back that city on the hill and saying, well, what would that look like for us, for black people? Uh, and then the same thing with the star, it's a socialist star, uh, but it's also kind of a light uh, that leads towards a better world. So we can see how the star is coming out of the scholar. Uh, it's almost like an imagining and pointing towards this better future. Um, so the themes in here, uh, socialism, but you know, we're talking about power, um, development, uh, moving towards something that is better uh, and liberating for black people. So check out his paintings. Like when you see these, um, if I was showing this class, it would be on a big screen. A lot of these paintings are relatively small and Douglas is using very, very fine paintwork. So not like um, some modernist artists who would be, you know, trying to show all this like gooey paint. Um, instead, it would be more like what you saw from, again, the futurists um, and analytic cubism and things like that. So the late African diaspora has some differences with what we saw in the earlier diaspora in the United States in that black people had access to accurate information about Africa because black people actually traveled back and forth to Africa. Uh, so people went on what, what sometimes was believed to be pilgrimages, you know, sometimes just look at it as, as trips or, or reconnecting. Um, and black nationalism um, started to build in the United States. Um, one of the forms of black nationalism was what you saw from the Nation of Islam, um, and then other forms of black nationalism took more socialist uh, turns like W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, and then you would see forms of, of, of black nationalism in other areas as well. So um, through these kind of movements, the idea that um, black people can come together uh, and liberate themselves uh, outside of white supremacist culture um, kind of makes its way into a lot of the art. Um, and some of the artists like Charles Searles went to Africa themselves uh, to kind of have this connection. Um, so when he went to Nigeria, um, he went to Lagos, uh, which is the um, former capital and largest city in Nigeria, now a megaopolis, as they say, with more than 20 million people. Uh, at this time, a very um, kind of like hustling, bustling city. Um, and he noticed like in the outdoor shops uh, that like what, what you would call bazaars, it was just like blown away, like with color and activity. Um, he just saw this as like um, an almost like overwhelming um, kind of like energy that was all around him uh, and it was bright and it was different than the types of energies that he perceived uh, in the United States. Um, so what he used for these works uh, when he's talking about filas for sale, that's these hats down here by Hauser of Traders. Um, <laughs> if you go to Chicago or New York, everyone's on, you see people uh, selling these sorts of things on the street as well. Sometimes they're Hauser, but uh, a lot of times it's more, more likely Caribbean. Um, so he wanted to use this open color palette to show um, this kind of activity, this energy, uh, the celebration of blackness, um, the brightness that you get um, when you go to Africa compared to um, places in the United States. The United States is, is mostly farther north 
um, than um, Nigeria, for instance, where uh, the sky and the sun literally seems brighter. Uh, so he uses this very open color palette to express all this energy and celebrate um, African blackness. So this one is kind of the same idea and Searles and others were involved in making connections between Africans and black Americans um, and especially for people who not everyone can go to, most people couldn't go to Africa. Uh, it was very difficult. It's, it's very difficult now. Um, so uh, they had, uh, did things like invited black artists um, to um, the United States uh, and then vice versa and tried to get these kinds of connections. So in this one, Celebration, um, he's talking about um, the drummers and dancers who were invited to the United States and did performances uh, to kind of show black people, uh, but also white people that happen to be around, <laughs> about um, African culture. Uh, so again, he's using this, this like um, open color palette, um, these very like sharp lines, um, lots of rhythm, uh, so lots of different patterns that are coming together um, to kind of mirror the, the energy and the movements uh, and sounds of the dancing and drumming. 